really was. Yeah. Yeah. They are not going to be I'm not to These are, this is a little bit, as we're trying to build a circle, <laughs> that is some of the conversation that we're going to have today. It's about the next gen. Huh? We need to make the circle quite a bit bigger. No, let's do that. No, no, what I want to know. Yeah. Yeah, no, let's, let's make this circle bigger. That's one of the contents of the time. So where we around this thing called the next generation. And what does that mean? So what I'm going to ask everyone to do is put their two feet flat on the ground. Um, and we're just going to take a breath in. Understanding that breath is the one thing that we all have and we all share. We're going to use it at the top of the, of the session and at the end of the session um, as a way to unify and also close in, but also open the space. So breath is the one thing we all share. Breath is something that gives us inspiration. Breath is the thing that drives us in the morning, but also the thing that gives us creativity. So with that, we're going to take a breath together binding this group together as far as being a community and kind of focusing on this idea of the next generation. So we're going to take a breath and the count of three. One, two, three. And we're going to exhale. Ashe, and with that, Harold's going to take us to the next level. <laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, what we'll do now is just some simple introductions, so we'll have the facilitators introduce themselves and then we'll go around the room. Um, so if you can say your name, your organization, or if you're an individual artist, where you're based, I think that's, that's yeah. it. All right. So I'll start and we'll go, well, you start. Okay, I'll go, okay. So my name is Jonathan McCorey. Um, I am the uh, Director of Theater Arts Programming at Dr. Barbara and National Black Theater in Harlem, New York. Um, and I'm one of your facilitators today. 
Hi everybody, my name is Candice Feldman. I'm the associate producer for 651 Arts and I will be part of a breakout session talking about imagining a utopia of work culture that allows work-life balance. My, my name is Harold Stewart. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm the performing arts coordinator at the South Dallas Cultural Center. I'm Shay Wafer, um, 651 Arts in Brooklyn, executive director. My name is Jennifer Gardner, I'm director of external affairs at Diverse Works in Houston and about to be the intern executive director. So, yeah. Hoping to learn a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Javon Collins, I'm a program director at the King Arts Complex in Columbus, Ohio. My name is Joshua Walters, based in Oakland, California, a resident artist with La Penny Cultural Center in Berkeley, California. Esteban Oscona, Mecca in Houston, Texas. I am the performance and residency program. Hi, I'm Stephanie Garcia. I'm an artist and I work as arts manager uh, in Mexico City. The name of my organization is the Best Artes and Iguana Profit Organization. Uh, Devin Berkshire, Associate Director of Conferences at Theater Communications Group, TCG in New York, and an independent theater artist. Vicki Meek, manager of the South Dallas Cultural Center in Dallas, Texas. Rory Trainer, uh, managing director of Alberta Presents in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm Taylor Bergen, program coordinator at Legion Arts in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I'm Peter Hay, I'm the development and PR director at Living Arts of Tulsa. Laura Ford, producing director of Bates Dance Festival, Lewiston, Maine. Crystal Brewer, associate director of Wanna Contemporary in Tulsa. Hi, my name is I'm developing a new company in San Diego, California. Carla Perlo, founding director of Dance Place, Washington, D.C. Sarah Creamer, artistic program manager and development associate at Dance Place, D.C. Robin Bush, program assistant international at the Atlantic Arts Foundation, Baltimore, Maryland. Stephanie Clemens, I work with National Performance Network, also with the local program. Brian Graham, I'm a graphic designer for the National Performance Network in New Orleans. Tom Graham, being <coughs> director of House Coast Performance Space in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, my name is Fidel Gomez. I'm a writer, actor, producer uh, from the Los Angeles Theater Center. My name is Javi Moreno. I'm an actor. I actually do social media for the Los Angeles Theater Center, and I'm here presenting, uh, representing Placas, uh, presenting tomorrow. Hi, I'm Sadi Falcon. I'm from Oakland, California. I'm an actor, visual artist, and multifaceted. Um, I'm also here with the Placas crew, so we'll be performing tomorrow evening. Thank you. I'm uh, Ricardo Salinas, a founding member of uh, Culture Clash Performance Trio, and um, I will be here performing tomorrow night in Placas at 8 o'clock Tuesday. <coughs> I'm Lydia Moore, and I am uh, the local site coordinator for this annual meeting, and I'm also a freelance uh, events and PR coordinator and a teaching artist. I'm Sean Elwood. I'm the director of programs and initiatives for Creative Capital Foundation. I'm Jessa Berry. I'm the general manager of Beth Morrison Projects and an independent theater producer in New York City. My name is Keaton Copper. I'm the founding executive and artistic director of Main Gallery in New Orleans. I'm Alvan Colon Lespierre, Associate Artistic Director of Pregones Theater in the Bronx. I'm Dasha Kelly from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm a performance artist, spoken word, and a writer, and I also have an independent program where we've done people's doors collecting. I'm Edgar Valoria, representing Everett Company Stage and School from Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Alice Manning. I'm the Managing Director and Co-Producer of The Yard out on Rose Vineyard. Uh, Jess Edkins, I'm the creative producer at Performance Space 122 in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Katie Collins, I'm the Urban Missions Coordinator at Columbia College Chicago. I'm Amelia Lumpkin, I'm the assistant to the Director of Programs at the Theater Offensive in Boston. <coughs> Wood, Cultural and Community Program Assistant uh, Coordinator for the Ashley Cultural Arts Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Spoken Word Arts. Steve Leggett, I'm the Artistic Director of Living Arts of Tulsa. Hi, my name is from Japan Foundation, New York. I'm the director of Performing Arts. Shoshana Bass is a physical performer, choreographer, and instructor, and daughter of Sangos Theater in Vermont. I guess I'm the father of Sangos. <laughs> 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 uh, Eric Bass. <laughs> Did we miss anyone? Hi, I'm Anna Hendel with the National Performance Network. Oh, good. Oh,
welcome to the space. There is a sign-in sheet, but we don't want to inundate you with all this. Like, sign this, fill this out. But before you leave the space today, because we do want to capture your information and make sure that we stay in touch, um, there's a sign-in sheet that will be positioned somewhere. Make sure your information is captured. Yeah, and just so you know, we won't be staying in the circle very long because okay. um, I'm going to give the structure and everything. I'm going to put the sign-in sheet on the back table, so that's where the location is. Just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Did everybody get a survey? Um, if you did not, let me know so we make sure that you have that. It's just some research that we're um, pulling from some of the conferences that we've been at. Um, so raise your hand. I think they're passing it up there. Oh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, why we're here today. Um, last year while we were at NPN, one of the questions that came up in the full partner meeting was succession and how to prepare and that there was a large group of arts administrators in my generation that weren't necessarily emerging but through a little bit past that mid-career and well, established enough to start having that conversation, but we were a little blindsided about, you know, this uh, retirement age that's shifting and how do we get going? And so, um, Harold actually was the one that asked the question. And then it was Javon and I that had lunch and we brought in Ashley Davis who organized this. And then um, three people turned into 17 in, Ma in Mimi's uh, suite last year. And then 17 turned into 30. And then over the entire year, um, we've been hosting learning calls that uh, we invite uh, people to come in and talk to us about specific things. And I actually have a year in review document. I wasn't expecting this many people, which is awesome. Um, but if you want to take a look at what we've been doing and who have been our guest uh, speakers on the phone, we've been recording it, sending out notes, and now we have a network of over a hundred young administrators that are nationally all across the, the country that tune in once a month to have conversations with us, and it's, um, it's been a really blessed uh, time. So we're here, and this is our year on review, and we're going to continue the conversation but what we like to do when we do these structures, and this is not our first one, we were at TCG, and um, it was a really great response, is we don't like to spend a lot of time talking about us. Because we're here to create action items and to think about creating relationships and bridging those gaps of really figuring out what does succession look like, what does transition look like, how do we start the conversation. You know, for some of us, it's very nervous things. We don't feel ready. For others, like, I love my executive director, Shay, and she has always said, I'm not gonna be here forever, Candace. And so that's a reminder that, you know, we gotta start having these conversations. So what we're gonna do is Harold, myself, and Jonathan are going to facilitate three breakout sessions. And um, we're each gonna tell you a little bit about them. And then we talk for 40 minutes within this group, within your small group, so that we can just flush it out, get real, get honest with each other, and then start <coughs> thinking of some action items, things that you can take away and go back to your organization and say, hey, I was here, we experienced this, I just wanna talk about it, if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, but we're about process and, and solutions, and that's what we really try to do. So I'm gonna let Jonathan talk about his, and um, we have Harold over here, I'm going to be here, and Jonathan is over there. So, Jonathan. All right. So, um, what's my my question that I am going to pose to my team is: What is the definition of next generation? What, how do we define ourselves? Um, the the conversation has typically gone to other gamuts. Like we, open, it's really it's really that's just the impetus or the starting point, and then we go from there to diving into the def definition. I'm um, talking about how do we identify ourselves? How do we build structure? How do we build community? Um, what does community look like, um, and how do we redefine ourselves consistently, and where do we come from that definition? Um, so I'll be over there having a discussion in that with that type of methodology inside of our head. Great, so I'll be in this corner again. Um, the conversation that I'll be facilitating is about a utopia nonprofit arts world, um, what that would look like if we had like perfect balance of life, money, passion and all of that and um, what we do here as next gen is we we really imagine and create um, without boundaries so if anything was possible what would it look like uh, to be there and what are the little things that we can start shifting in our daily work life so we can create balance 
already. So that's what I would be talking about over there with y'all. So I've been charged with the task uh, and the question, how do we, I'm so tall over right now, I feel like when I stand up, <laughs> how do we bridge the gap, right? So um, I welcome people who are interested in that idea. And I'm glad that we have an intergenerational yeah. group here um, because it is not a one-sided conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make sure my group is like well represented. Um, and, and it's a vision session, right? So it's not just to sit and complain and stuff, but to really think about, we know that there's a need out there, yeah. so let's be kind of process oriented and, and filling that gap and addressing that need. I think a very important thing that Harold did just say is a vision session. So each of the sessions are a vision session, a session, a space for us to actually envision a paradigm which we want to live in and, and, and addressing the paradigm that we're in, but really talking about that bridge between how do we get to point A to point B. So we're going to break up into those groups. We're going to spend 40 minutes with each, with each other, and then um, somebody from the group is going to report back to the entire group of what was discussed and some of the takeaways from that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is we did this at TCG, and then we also did uh, put out a public report. If you are interested in a public report from our TCG, I have a couple copies here. Any of the documents that you would like to have, all you have to do is sign up on our sheet and as part of the next gen, you get access to our Google Drive, which gives you all the recordings from the past year, notes, notes that um, our guests that have um, started the conversation and given us, given us documents is in there as well. So there's a lot of resources through that and it's, we've been doing this for free and as a labor of love for the entire year. So that's a lot of good work that's been happening. I just wanna throw that out to all my next gen, okay? Um, so with no further stuff, let's break out and start having it. If, we, if I don't have any no questions, let's do it. Let's get going. <laughs> So in a perfect world, the merger of those things, what do they look like? Okay, so there's a really smooth and nice transition 
from the uh, people who are kind of holding the, the authority to the people who are not. And, and it overlaps so that there's a mesh of mentorship uh, that can be passed on the information, but the new ideas are not squelched. There has to be a way to honor the past while making room for the So, Ryan, what's your name? You can say your name. Amelia. Amelia. Uh, the person who is moving on from an organization feels fulfilled. We're not just going to go away. Okay? We don't disappear. <laughs> if he or she wishes. Okay, hold on. You're not here. Okay, and one thing I would say. <laughs> Your spirit is still there. All right. <laughs> yes, same. Okay, we are talking about a perfect translation. Right? Perfect. Money. 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 <laughs> And let me tell you what we're going to do in the second part of this, because um, I really would like for this to just just spit it out. The second part of this question is how do we get there, right? So we can tease uh, some of these things out, so we can talk about the multiple resources and things like that. So I just want us to, to let us know that. Don't feel like you have to cut it off, because we'll tease these things out. Well, just following up on the money thing, I think it's like, Leaving, uh, leaving an organization in good financial shape to be taken over by the question of which the trend. We'll continue around the product. Yeah. 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 And fearless is that both people being fearless. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sustaining the integrity. It's a little bit of what she said. Sustaining the integrity, and I would say in all ways, in terms of stability, financial stability, capacity, and really the soul of an organization is to me the most important. The artistic vision. The artistic vision. Yeah. And can you circle that one for me? Because that's one that I really want to make sure that we get some time to talk about. And I would actually like to complicate. He worked eight days. We have a good juicy conversation. Okay, over. And it's interesting. I was going to say, in, in addition to being respectively engaged after the transition, also willingly and graciously giving up control. Yeah. Um, but who? By the, the transitioning out uh, administrator uh, and relinquishing the control to the new team. Yeah. 
and the yeah. person who yeah. is yeah. leaving, yeah. really allowing yeah. that person yeah. their mentor yeah. to practice that yeah. tradition yeah. in all ways. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. I think Laura talked about yeah. that a little more. But yeah. it's rather than just telling yeah. and sharing, yeah. it's also allowing. Yeah. 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 I think we're saying practice. I we can make a practice. I mean, I mean, we're the next generation. I know we can practice. Um, I'm, I'm part of my organization is actually brand new. It's only two and a half years old, so speak up. It's, it's kind of a little bit. It's not about transition so much, but it's it's actually a transition from of uh, funding sources. So basically, I find something. <laughs> trying to get that organization to a point where it's getting financing from outside of the you know, And so in a perfect world, uh, it would go from starting from someone's pocket to going to grants and development um, in a more smooth way, I don't know. Or just being self-sustaining. Yeah, self-sustaining. And not dependent on the founder. Right. Under self sustaining I guess in my situation, it's like, I mean, I don't know what you guys are doing. Yeah, um, this is a tough one to remember, but yeah. overall, institutional yeah. so it's like memory, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the transitioning out of the leader has been there for 10, 20 years. And so just the history of them being the point person for the organization and being able to pass on their contacts without Ruining those relationships. Oh, they want to hire you. It's really fun. Here. I think that in a perfect, in a perfect world, perfect transition is holistic and looks not only at that top executive position, but how transition affects the whole team, whatever that looks like in an organization. Okay, and then we'll end with Sam, unless someone has just a burning thought. Yeah, okay. And then we'll go into I think the goal is that we don't know we talked about, but uh, finding the right leaders. Finding the right leaders? <laughs> So now we want to figure out how do we 
get to. Keeping in mind this is perfect, but there's still some pathways to at least try to get towards perfection. Um, and one of the things that since we're on there, it seems to be um, sustaining integrity and the capacity and vision, institutional memory, uh, which has come up in our other work, especially if you have what we call like a, leg a legacy organization or founder-led organization, and that founder is leaving and they have some clear ideas, thoughts, that for whatever reason, either you were not born, um, you came from another planet, you know? So it's kind of, it's kind of hard sometimes to catch the vision or, but then on the other side, sometimes it's kind of hard to articulate the vision because science has changed. Um, so thinking about the issue in terms of you want your um, the organization integrity to be sustained, um, but again, you may be forced with a person again who has either a short history with the organization, the vision is not clear. How, what is the solution? So one thing I wanted to say is um, <coughs> some real common sense notes on both things, but uh, particularly in the case where you may not have the ideal transition, getting as much of what you do on paper, uh, a manual for the organization and for every position, but especially for the founder, and they're very, they very rarely exist, because no one has to do. Um, so that it's a, a manual in a way that people can refer to. It's a lesson about the how, it's not the why necessarily. That should be in there too. Uh, as just, you know, a guidebook. It's a guidebook. It's a what it is that the organization does. That leadership has been able to communicate that to the constituency, to the funders, to the elected officials, and has done it very articulately and with a lot of passion. The leadership, uh, the community leadership, the uh, elected officials and the funders have become allies. So when this group of leaders from the organization leaves, how is it that the ones that will come will be equipped either to restore that trust, the trust breaks down, or will be equipped to build um, the relationship with the existing outside leadership? So it's just a question. So I have, can I ask questions um, about the question? How long did it take to cultivate those relationships? Oh, 25 years. And in most succession plans, how long do you have to try to bring somebody? Three months. No, I mean, this is, I, I mean, all right, all right. So part of how we get there is if we can build out long succession plans. And again, this is an idea. This is with the proper resources, identifying the proper people, whether we train them, they grew up in the organization. But I think if this group, especially since we have leaders that are about to transition, begin to say one year succession plans for our field is not 
this is my profession. One of the things that, and I'm, I'm trying to facilitate as much, not just to talk, but one of the things in doing this work, um, what we had to be clear about who we represent, first and foremost, are not large arts organizations, right? Because they can do a national search, they can have five to ten top contenders, people who work for NEA, you know, that's not everybody's reality, right? So when you're thinking about this, you're thinking about small, progressive, people of color, rural organizations, right? So I wanted to kind of say that, because there are people who have resources that, you know, somebody can say I'm leaving tomorrow, they can choose five people the next day, and the organization doesn't really miss eight, but I don't know if that's you. I mean, if it's y'all, congratulations. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so again, so we, so part of this is, is empowerment for the people who are affected by these things to begin to figure out how to articulate some of the issues around society. So I think there's there's mentorship, there's practice shift, there's mentorship, there's also a role that the person who wants to move into a leadership position that is work that they have to do. It's not on all of the person who's leaving the organization or who's planning this succession. That individual also has to be, you know, be it go back to school, be it, you know, learning new skills, but it's, it, it's not just, you know, I've been with this organization and I'm talented and I should, I should you know, succeed you. There's also work, the, 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 the successor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the successor has to do it. I called it initiative. Initiative. Yeah. What, what do you call it? Initiative. Oh, yeah. I think it's a very important word as leaders to identify those those people who have the version to say, okay, you have the version, follow me, let's do this. I, I, I'm a physical journalist. So if I can do that, then I'll take you with it. So we would be proud. You're not to create that leadership for the next generation. Samuel, is it okay that I call that an open identification of the candidates? Yes. Totally agree. And maybe echo you know, what was just said about the fact that it's all about the mind, the healthy vision of a young person. listening to you what comes to mind it's like where does honesty come into the equation in terms of you know one either if you're the next gen being honest enough to or feeling empowered enough to say this is what i need to know this is what i want to know but also from a retiring leader um the honesty to be able to say well this is what i made up um because there was no 
kind of book to follow. <laughs> this is where I failed, and these were the great successes that I had trying to figure this thing out because I think it takes a little bit of a pressure off of the younger generation when you feel like you don't know for whatever reason. And I think the, the more you can have open, honest conversations, you never know how liberating that is because you don't understand um, sometimes this generation has been dying to tell somebody, hey, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> it's just by the good grace of the arts guides that, you know, this work. But all we took risks, you know, what is creative risk coming from? Yes, communication is absolutely key. Yes. And building those bridges. Yes. I'm going to introduce you to the next person who is going to be leading this organization. I believe in this person. I trust this person, and I hope that you'll continue to fund the organization and trust the leadership. That's in fact guiding very, very necessary. But also, we're not always allowed to pick our, to select the successor. Like in our situation, it's going to ultimately be up to the succession committee of the board of directors that will also include some staff people. I don't really get to choose who is going to follow me as the artistic director of dance ones. On the other hand, I can have input to say, and we need to have a staffing structure, not, and I think this was mentioned, but you need to look at the staff structure that existed because it, it came about organically. You have a founding director that scrambled and, and paid themselves less and then hired another person and paid themselves less and hired another person, which is how most of our organizations had staff. Okay, so now it's got a big staff and it's got a support. And now it's time for us to transition out. So now we have to really look at the staffing structure that's going to work for the organization it is now, not the organization it was 35 years ago, and who will lead that staff. But the other thing, um, and I want to do this physically with Sarah because this is what I have all the time. So, so Sarah's going to stand behind me. Okay, so I'm leading and I'm leading and I go as fast as she's behind me and she's pushing me forward, she's pushing me forward. In order for her to have that practice ship, now we've got to stand next to each other. How are you doing? How are you doing? Are you doing okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna help you out if you make a mistake, but keep going, keep going, keep going. And then at some point she's got to step forward. And then, behind her. but I have to let her step forward to truly lead if she's going to lead, and I got to get out of the way. And that's why I said, my generation, we've got to step back so that they can step forward, but we have to have their back. And that's a tricky thing because it pushes me out of the way, pushes her forward physically and in every way. But I gotta step back and get out of the way. So then what do I do? And I was gonna say to my colleagues, that's the most important thing. We have to think about what are we doing? What will be our role? And if you think it's hard for you to step forward, believe me. For us to step back and figure out what this is, is where that's what we're gonna talk about tomorrow. Oh, I'm sure they're gonna be just a time like that. Yeah, we're gonna talk about tomorrow. Okay. Because one of the things, and, and I'll say that because again, usually it's a, uh, it's it's younger people in the room when we're talking, and, and some of these things come up. One of the things that often comes up is, do I feel empowered enough to talk to my boss? I am one of the fortunate few who can have these conversations, and but what if you're not in that situation? And one of the things that we talked about in San Diego was are our bosses having these conversations yeah. and are they having them openly, yeah. frankly, and do they feel safe that there's a safe space to talk about all this? So I'm glad to know that this space is a good one. Kind of, kind of off of Carla's comment, mm -hmm. um, is that a lot of the like, transition things are about giving previously determined knowledge about the institution for potentially decades to the next person. And as you know, the, the upcoming generation, I worry about our ability to be able to change the institution for the better with all of this kind of predetermined knowledge and structure in the past. 
you, and that's something that I see a lot of young leaders struggling with, um, is trying to evolve the organization with the artists, funders, as, as staffing structures change, and being empowered to make that change without facing the support and the integrity of the organization to be able to be in the organization that it is now, not the organization that it was when it was founded 30 years ago. One of the one of our forthcoming conversations is what does it mean to curate another generation? Not necessarily our generation, but curating the generation of work that happened before us. And where do we have voice? And how do we? Because somebody talked about honoring the past and things like that. But where is there a, a balance? Because again, what you see nationally is that um, there are a lot of organizations that want to bring another generation in in terms of donor based, audience based, but may not be willing to take the program risk to bring that organization in because of what's been sustained. I mean, and there's a risk because what's sustained in the Institute is a group of people that like a certain state. Um, but how does that, you know, kind of solve the problem? But what you'll find um, sometimes is that replacements look like someone who's going to continue to curate the things that I've curated for the last 30 years when there may be some changes that may um, need to happen for various reasons. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The other thing is the, the practice ship and the clear communication and the mentoring is all any organization should be doing in their own self-interest anyway. But there are a lot of organizations that have a staff that is made up of wonderful lieutenants. And their jobs are done well because they remain as lieutenants and there's nobody to move up into an executive board. I'm kind of curious to ask the group if there's a feeling uh, that anyone here has here of balancing bringing somebody up within the organization or bringing somebody from outside. I mean, is there a preference that you have to that? Um, and be able to have them transition in rather than have someone come outside. But I'm certainly not opposed to bringing someone in outside if I can't find anybody that I think could take my place. Right. Yeah, I think that you would hope that someone who's there is passionate about the work that you've done because of that. And then you can move them up along. We gotta be able to take the criticism. That, that's a big thing for us in the young generation as well. Be able to take that constructive criticism and turn it into you know, problem program. But at the same time, somebody outside has expertise that you may not have because you've been here for 20 years. You may be a great curator. There's a tradition of visual arts for a while, taking curators and making the museum directors. Right. And there are a lot of curators that are not prepared and don't have the skill sets to be good directors. Oh, they can't be all So he said you may be a great curator but it doesn't necessarily make you a great museum director. So are we still listening or are we into an open conversation? Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel's taking on more of the curating responsibilities. 
I'm doing the administrative stuff, but we do have to bring in some of the outside. I mean, between us, we have lots of experience, but not in the direct face-to-face -face individual fundraising, the kind of um, community yes. profile, yes. Yes. profile that person needs to have. I mean, we're in a bigger city, so it, that is a little bit different as well. So I just think it depends on the organization, what, <coughs> but it's a little scary. <laughs> so, what I want to add to this list, I think sometimes uh, the the succession is not one person's job being handed to another person, but a complete restructuring of the way the staff works, that it's a redistribution of those jobs based on who the organization has become and also be based on, on recognizable skills of the successors. I want to do it. I just want to go back to what Samuel said, money, uh, especially for very, well, for everyone, but for very small organizations. My son is. Everyone is able to one and three quarters um, for, for 10 months of the year. Um, money, fearlessness, and honesty. I think, and Jess, I wanted to respond to your, I think that we need, it's the way we frame the conversation that has to be fearless and has to be honest and has to be on our side about letting go and making space for practiceship. But um, that I think that, that we have to look at the history as context. We always do better going forward when we understand the context in which we're working and we, we came from. So I think if we think about the con that, that history of an organization, the how, the why, all of it as the context, and then we look at where are we now, where is the world that we're living in now, then we figure out the right, right solutions for the present and the future and have to put that in the hands of the next generation. But I, hopefully with the team, I think, you know, going to Alvin's comment, it's so important to think about the relationships that we maybe as leaders individually have developed and hopefully we put our staff into so we're not the only conduits for sustaining those relationships. That's incredibly important. But I think we need to be talking to the funding community more about how important it is at this juncture to be supporting these transitions. Because that, I mean, is one of the biggest issues, is how do we create not only the ideal, but the essential kind of transition where we can bring somebody in and have that beautiful sort of overlap that Carla usually manifested, which feels like the right way to do it um, without the support without some money coming in to pay those salaries. So I, I feel like some energy needs to be going into articulating that need and that argument. We have about five more minutes. I think you are, you're, you're still a very key point, which is the essential. What's you know, I mean, we all want to do it. 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 Great things. But in this day and age, we need to be consistent. We need to be consistent. To run all of the things. You know, if we don't let you know, if we don't let you know, how do we get out there? How do we get out there? You know, we need to see that. Yeah. 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 Because there is a big difference in my view of what you want and what you need. So we may want all that in order to uh, make viable a transition that is smooth, efficient, effective, but maybe we don't need all that. 
Maybe we just need four or five of those. So I just want you know to throw that out there. We got to make a very big distinction between what we want and what we need. I think we also make a, a distinction between what we need and what we can get. So I think we need a plan B. <laughs> so let's do this. And, uh, Because we think we know what you need because we know what you've taken to get to this point, but what do you need for the Well, I, I need, well, not to be, well, but in a way, one of the things that we didn't talk about is making sure that if you can, you leave the organization in a healthy place. Because trying to, it's, it's over there. So we, we, I think we need the organizations in a certain place that it that we can build. And that's what we're talking about the organizations. We're also talking about how we one appealing to this, this next generation. Hey, come take this job that you love that's not going to pay you a lot um, because you have this passion and there's also a transfer of skills, also a different a new way that business is done, that you know, communities are built, different reasons different intangibles that they need to be successful. So it may be, I just need to see my name on a letterhead, or I want to know that I have a chance to do more, or I want to be involved in um, doing projects with other art groups or city organizations. I don't know. There are different things that they're going to need. We know what it takes for the organization needs. When we talk about what the founders need personally, emotionally, what the next generation need personally, thing that I as a very experienced person continue to feel is that there is because the world that we all exist in is so challenging and that there's like the, the older generation has had to fight so hard to the that are amazing and we are and we are so proud to be part of these young people that there's there's a little bit of like this of the holding so tight and the, the, the ownership and the, the feeling of, but I, I, I literally bled and sweated and like ruined my family and like didn't save for retirement and like I'm literally going out into the world, you know, moving on from this, right? Five minutes. Feeling like I, and feeling like I, 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 I did all of this and what is it, what's gonna happen? I'm so afraid that it's not gonna live. It's not going to stay the way I work so hard. Maybe it's, it's going to. You. Maybe it's a lesson to you. Also, they're saying don't do what I do. Don't do what I do. Like there's a referendum. I wouldn't at all say those words. I actually would say that I think it's more about a, 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 just trustworthy people. A little bit more like of an opening and a sharing and, a, and of a I want you as this next generation to participate in my revenue. I want you to. I made that I did because I know that that's what's happening next. And instead, I often feel that there's more of a, well, I, I know that you have to do this, and eventually you're going to be able to do this, but you can't do this now. You know, you just have to like understand that you're young, you don't know very much, you can't. And I'm just like preaching. But I want you to like, yeah, you know what I mean? I just want to make that space. I just want to throw in that, like, a lot of my things are like, I want to tell you, you know, don't make the mistakes in life. You know, like, really. That's. It's not, uh, I don't have, it's not like I'm in the position to do that very much. But I mean, there, there's, but I think that's, that's very clear versus I'm holding and you haven't 
put in the blood, sweat, and tears. But I think that's two different okay. conversations. Okay. So, yeah. Well, well, I was like just going to say your visual right now, the holding tight brought up something else, which is uh, visually came in my magnets, only the opposing sides. So there is this thing where we want to come together, and yet there is this void in the middle. And right now, as I'm listening, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with another kind of component, which is as an artist of color and watching many of my elders and our Latino arts organizations struggle so hard for opportunities and whatnot, there seems to be, again, this like magnetism that's not coming together where there becomes this kind of gap between the younger generation and older generation that's actually not getting talked about. And so that's where I'm like kind of coming from a different perspective and actually just embracing all of your guys' wonderful ideas and, and discussion. We hope to bring that back to our own community. What, what do you think is the big talk? Well, just that. I feel like we struggle so hard. We've struggled so hard for our resources and opportunities that then it's like, how, how does one let go and then start to cultivate another generation of artists? And I think that's just something as Latino artists that, that we, we just haven't gone to that next step to be like, let's embrace this next generation that's coming up to So us. what we have to do, and there are a lot of wonderful opportunities, just so this is not a, a just a conversation amongst ourselves, but we leave with some kind of commitment to ourselves to do something, so we can go around really quickly with an action. So hopefully you've heard something, you've been inspired, you're thinking about something, and if you can share that with the group, we'll jot it down. And this is something personally that you are committing to do, and that way at least there's some success, you know, out of this time here that you thought about something you can do to kind of change um, what you're seeing. So just really quick, you want to start? I'm going to share. Share and get out of the way. Step up and step back. Step out. Step out. Okay. Step out. Step out. Step out. Okay, here we go. I'm going to write the guidebook that I Right. Okay. Now do it. Yeah, I'm going to tell my story as honestly as I possibly can. I'm going to initiate the conversation. Initiate the conversation that's not being had.
for young leaders to take the opportunity and improve themselves. That's, I, I want to, but I'm not allowing them enough opportunities. I think, um, I also think that management training is very important. Management training? Yeah. So, you, so what are you going to do? Um, talk to my boss and uh, do some new programs. Okay. Everything you all said. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back and explain, try to reiterate all of this to my company. So that they should all try to figure out what are the next steps that we need to take in our organization to create these gaps and opportunities for people to we, we need one and a half more minutes. We're large groups. <laughs> you got one minute. I'm going to um, try and maintain uh, transparency in the organization, both on the board and uh, yeah. in the organization. Um, just to use generosity as the new, um, you know, the new uh, transitional people and folks and young folks come in and, and even though I'm struggling still, to just be generous and work mutually in conjunction with them for as long as possible. Um, ignite the conversations and hopefully um, yeah. use inspiration to kind of open up conversations. I'll uh, gracefully try to transition as my present position that it may be relevant by seeking a learn and applying it to the field rather than the field. Mm. Uh, being proactive about creating opportunity for transfer of skills and knowledge instead of waiting for it. Requesting that the board be more transparent in the process and include the staff more in the transitional plan. Keep learning, keep asking for more information, and I keep maybe saying the things that are not so easily said or talked about. Now, who's going to do? And I'm going to remind Allison that it's it's not too late to go to dental school. There are alternatives. Now we need that can help to support next generation and help to create a bridge, um, which probably would tie into Harold a little bit. So, yeah. all yours. All right, so, thanks again, Dawson. 
Uh, so as far as the definition of our next generation leaders, uh, as far as arts administrators, uh, we had quite a few words we had up here. But the words that we thought really exemplified what we we're trying to accomplish with this is that our next generation leaders are entrepreneurs at heart. Uh, we were saying that if we're not able to do it one way, we'll find the next way to do it and get it done. Uh, also, our ideas, of course, free, open, and fresh. That goes with our vision for the future. But we also stated that, you know, knowledge, of course, we have to know our past presently to get to our future. So we were also talking about that in our solutions. And a couple other things were equity, making sure that there's equal opportunity amongst us all and as, far as, as far as our global uh, opportunities since we're all connected. And I think one of the bigger ones was compensation. Because, you know, hey, it's tough. So we're just saying, you know, is compensation kind of leading people, you know, arts administrators away from the field because they can't really earn a living? I can't even afford to have a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, as far as the solutions we had, we're an online platform so we could share, you know, throughout the year because we do so much and we only see each other twice a year. So we're just talking about possibly video conferencing this week. I had to discuss that if someone wanted to reach her, you know, if she had someone posing a question to her, maybe she y'all can Skype in and, and have that discussion. So, you know, as the next generation leaders, we have to take the initiative to reach out to our elders and, and get that information that they have, that they may not even give to us unless we ask them. And that's the same respect that they give us is the same respect we give them. All right? Also, the second piece was the institutional legacy. We were talking about the history. You can't be primed to lead an organization if you don't even know how it started. And a lot of our next generation leaders are not even concerned about the past. All they're thinking about is right now and the future. So you have to be well versed in that. And the last piece was the long term observation and participation uh, within various roles. Also, the communication in both directions as far as our elders and the next generation leaders and the commitment to the institution building as an organizational culture. So we have to continue to invest in ourselves as next generation leaders, but invest into the organization, and then hopefully that creates a larger return. So that is our definition. I'm not sure if I got everything from the group. Yeah. We good? Yeah. 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 the gap we had three sort of mini conversations within our big conversation one was envisioning this perfect transition our perfect transition is smooth and fearless there's money on all the ends of it there's a gracious release of control and someone ready right away to take the control and everyone is happy um, so that was really easy to envision <laughs> and then we talked about how to get there and things got really interesting um, and we were talking about how to get there looking at two sides of a coin of a person leaving a position and a person coming into a position um, but we broke that down as well talking about is this person going out a founder as well as a leader and who is this person coming in are they coming in from within are they coming in from outside um, and we asked some questions about those dynamics uh, and some examples of steps on how to get there that we came up with was open identification of candidates of that could potentially be new leaders so we were talking about this idea of secession planning happening over a long period of time, and instead of giving someone quick three months to learn how to do a job that someone did 30 years to figure out how to do it perfectly, um, <laughs> actually giving people more time, which means identifying people when they're much younger um, and bringing them up for a while. We talked about like honesty and transparency in these conversations, whether it's the leader and the emerging leader, the staff and the board, um, community and people within the organization. There were lots of dynamics brought into that one. Always having a plan B. 
that, that was basically how we resolved everything. It's really hard to <laughs> <laughs> always have a plan B. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh yes, this one I really enjoyed clarifying the context. Um, so the context in which the organization was created and mm -hmm. looking at the context as it moves through, comparing that to the current context and seeing how the integrity of the organization is kind of a thread flowing through that and doesn't have to be anchored necessarily to one context as, it, as we're re-envisioning it in this present or in a future. Um, and then we all took on actions that we're going to do after this conference or starting right now um, in order to get us all the way over there. And um, mine, I'll share mine, because that's a good thing to do, um, is to try to congratulate myself for taking risks as I move towards leadership and try to be that demanding young leader that's saying, give me information and give me a chance and I will lead right now. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the end. Woo! Yeah. Certain things, 
actually sat down and had one-on-ones with their employees and heard what their employees actually need rather than just kind of making a decision about what employees need without listening to them. So that was the big, the, the whole give and take with leaders of organizations was a big one. Um, I mean, it'd be awesome if organizations provided child care or if theaters or, or performing arts organizations provided child care to parents coming to see their performances so that when we have these active personal and family lives, it doesn't take away from our professional needs and our, and our needs to be involved in the community still on that same level. Um, and if leaders could model uh, the behavior that we sort of feel like we need to maintain healthy individual lives, um, it's very hard to keep up with your leaders sometimes when they're not turning off. So if leaders could actually turn themselves off from time to time, you send the message to your employees that it's okay to turn yourselves off from time to time and to have some lives outside of your, your organizational environment. So what if your leader bounces back and says, it turned out that <laughs> Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that comes back to communication, right? I mean, I'm not saying every leader in this room is gonna be like, yeah, no problem, I'll just, you know, I'll stop getting work emails on my phone. That's an easy transition to make. It's like we all, we all live and breathe our work, right? And I think uh, we talked a little bit about habit. Once small habits start to change, what kind of ripple effect does that have in your in your organizations and in your communities and in your lives? So that's is that sum it up? Yeah. <laughs> personal commitment, whether if it was to set up boundaries or to remind them that they were valuable or that they do have expertise and worth. So um, we had a nice positive uh, ending. So just to wrap up some things before I give it to Jonathan, we have peace sheets that I think you need to get, fill out. We have surveys that I'm going to need back. Um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, once again, we do once a month calls. Uh, we have a support group, a network that uh, we are really proud of, and we continue this journey and at other conferences as well, so we'd love feedback. Uh, we will be sending out a report that we've done like we did for TCG, so if you want that, we need your email. So that's what the sign-up is for. Um, Going to give it over to Jonathan. Going to give it over to Jonathan. So one of the things that I want to say, again, thank you for your time and being in this space. But one thing that I would really, really like to emphasize is you should never be afraid to articulate a need. So 11 months ago, when I stood in a room with all our annual partners, all of our partners at the annual meeting, and identified a need, we could never envision that this would happen 11 months later. This um, many people that we have been able to build coalition with across the nation. So it's very empowering, especially for younger um, administrators to just articulate that need, even if it's a risk. Um, and then talk about the things that we're doing right, what's working. Because it's so easy when you talk about successions, generations, to just focus on the negative. But if you can just identify those positive things, then it kind of gives you the energy to say at least tomorrow I can try to go forward because some good things are coming out of that. Amen. And so like this is a very, very good thing coming out of something that could have been seen as very ugly. So I want to again show my gratitude to each and every one of you. The co-facilitators, it's like the best co-facilitation team in the world. We, actually, <laughs> we really like each other. We call each other every now and again to say, it's like, your organization trying to kill you? Yes, me too. OK, let's breathe. All right, bye, we're going to work. Um, but so we have this. And, and Ashley Davis was not here, um, but Ashley is the glue, baby. This, if this looks like it was organized and put together, thank Ashley Davis of Austin and Ruth, who stays on our case. Thank, we love you, Ashley. She's watching, I'm sure. Um, and so now I'll give it over to John. All right, so, so what we're going to do, we're just going to take a unifying breath just to close this out. This is kind of uh, we open the space with the breath, we're just going to close it with the breath. Um, acknowledging that we shared something today, acknowledging that we've been. Hopefully, we've, our, our brains have been opened up to maybe new ideas, new thoughts of how to address um, the next generation or this idea of succession or this idea of how we move forward into the future. So um, we're just going to take a breath. If everyone can put their two feet flat on the ground, connecting to Mother Earth, saying thank you to the ground in which you stand on. And we're just going to take a breath to the count of three. One, two, three.
All right, so one, two, three. And exhale. Ashe, thank you so much. <laughs> Is going to see you through where we did not quite get that. You know, a lot of 